following message is presented by Community Gospel Church in Bremen, Indiana. It is our great privilege to share this ministry with you. We in no way intend for this to be a replacement for the local church. It is our prayer that this would serve as a resource to help make Jesus Christ known in our congregation and other congregations gathering across the world. For more information about Community Gospel Church, visit www.communitygospelchurch.com. If you would, open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 is where we're at. We're looking at the Sermon on the Mount, and we've been doing this for the past couple of weeks, and I just think it's so fun to study God's Word with you guys and learn and just kind of go through this. And um, Jesus has given essentially a, a really famous sermon, and one of the things that I've noticed about my walk with Jesus is he changes ordinary objects into things that are extraordinary, and he just causes me to look uh, at things a different way. Um, I think in the years that I have walked with Jesus, uh, I, I, there are so many things in my life that I just don't look at the same, and they're ordinary objects that I just look at completely different. They point me back um, to Jesus and, and my relationship with him. And last week, we talked a little bit about that when Jesus says in the Beatitudes, those of you who uh, hunger and thirst, and hopefully last week, you know, when you were um, going through your day, you were thinking about hunger and thirsting, and it made you hunger and thirst for something um, that is righteous, that is of the Lord, that is, that is of him, and not just for that physical food. And that's kind of what we're after here today is to do the same thing. We're going to hopefully um, get you to look at two everyday ordinary objects, completely different. Maybe it will help you in your relationship with Jesus. The first thing that we're going to talk about is table salt. Um, and table salt looks like this. And this is from uh, the church kitchen. And I just hope that it gets back there because I know they're going to ask. They're going to be like, who stole all the salt from the kitchen? Um, I did. <laughs> it's up here. Um, so that's table salt. And uh, if you Google table salt, what you'll find out is table salt's really bad for you. Did you know that? I'm going to ruin your whole day. <laughs> so um, table salt's actually manufactured. When they manufacture table salt, they strip it of all of its minerals. And um, many companies will add what is called an anti-caking element to table salt. And what it will do is it will essentially... Um, cause this aluminum type material to accumulate in your brain. It causes diseases like Alzheimer's. You can Google it. That's what I did this last week. I was learning about salt. And uh, I learned table salt is also uh, fortified with iodine. I went downstairs and I got this from the kitchen today and it said iodinized table salt. And I was like, ah, validation. So even more reason to pour it into my mason jar. And uh, what, what happened was in the 1920s, they started putting iodine to treat a problem that was prevalent in society with people's thyroid glands. And, it, and then they realized it was bad for you, but you know what? They just kept it around. They, they said, eh, there's so much of it out there. We'll just keep it out there, right? And uh, so some habits are hard to break. So my goal, first of all, is to get you to look at table salt a little bit differently and maybe not use table salt, all right? And don't email me and be like, Jordan, I Googled it, and table salt's actually really good for you. Um, well, there is salt that is good for you. This is Himalayan salt. Um, I have Himalayan rock salt on there on your slip, but uh, Himalayan salt's really good for you, and we're slowly putting this in all areas of my home because I said so, and Bethany is fighting me tooth and nail. So you just pray for her and her heart that it changes. <clears throat> That's been my prayer for the past 13 years. Um, <clears throat> Himalayan salt is real manly because it's pink in color, so even more reason for us to have it in the house. That's all I need is another pink thing in my house with three girls. I have the dog, though. He's a man. Yeah, he's not a man. He's a dog. Male dog. Okay. Anyway, we're going to be all right today, I promise. Himalayan salt's interesting, though. It's located near the Himalayas, which is the reason for the name in Pakistan, and uh, it's essentially hand-mined. So what they do is they, they pull this stuff out. There's no additives in it. It's like table salt, but it's not. It's pure. Uh, it looks like salt, but it's not salt. It's a little bit different. And what we see in uh, Himalayan salt is uh, that it's not polluted. So it's something that we can use and that can help us, and there's benefits for it. And you can Google some of this stuff. I prefer that you didn't do it today while I'm, I'm speaking to you, like you wait on that. Um, <clears throat> sometimes that happens too. We'll be riding in the van and Bethany will be like, I'll be like, did you hear the second point? She'll be like, well, I was Googling something that you said. And I'm like, it was really good. So I just send her the sermon link uh, the next day. 
in heaven, uh, wives, pastors' wives get to talk, and pastors have to shut up the whole time. So <clears throat> you'll get your revenge. Don't worry about it. We should probably pray and ask God's blessing upon his word before we look at it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth and the fact that Jesus looks at us and he says, I want you to look at things a little bit differently. And uh, today we're going to look at salt and we're going to look at light and we're going to hopefully change some perspectives. And hopefully we're going to eliminate that which entangles us um, and trips us up and replace that with something that is a little bit more pure so that we can be effective for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would help me be clear today. That's so important as we look at your text. And that you would help us not to become puffed up with knowledge, but we would use this in our everyday lives. As light bearers, we're also called to be light givers. And so help us as we look at your truth from this great sermon and help us to understand it in a way um, that that would impact our lives and conform us more to the image of Jesus Christ, our loving Savior, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again. So speak uh, in ways I can't, God. Thank you so much for this church and these people. I love being a part of this community. And what you're doing in this place is amazing. And I pray just a blessing upon them and the people who can't be here today. Just continue to um, work in and through our lives as we learn just about how much you love us. In your name, amen. All right, let's start at chapter five, verse one, and we'll get rolling. There's three essentially parts of Jesus' opening in the sermon. He says, seeing the crowd, Jesus went up in the mountain and he sat down with his disciples, the 12 that are in front of him, the disciples who would follow him that are beyond those 12, and then it extends to Matthew's readers, uh, those who heard it when it was first written, and those of us today. So disciples is anyone who has confessed with their mouth and believed in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is a disciple of Christ. Okay? I believe that he is the Messiah and his blood covers my sin. And Jesus opens up his mouth and he teaches them and he says that you should be like this. These are attributes of my followers. Blessed are these people when they do these things. The poor in spirit who have gotten to the end of themselves, they inherit the kingdom of heaven, eternal life. Blessed are those who mourn over their sin, for they shall be comforted, who mourn over the loss of the fact of themselves. Five, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Those people who have powerful personalities, right, that are under control. Look at your neighbor and say, that's you. Oh, some of you didn't say that. All right, that's interesting. Uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, as we've been given mercy from God, so we also give it back. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God manifest himself in every day of their life and also for eternity. Blessed are the peacemakers, those who uh, strive not to cause divisions among others. And blessed when you do all these things, those who are persecuted, for you inherit again the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. And in verse 12 it says, the same happened with the prophets. Verse 13, our passage this morning. You, Jesus says, and he's looking at you. Say me. Say me again. Say me again. This is for you, my disciples. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its taste, how shall it again be salty? Or how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underneath people's feet. Jesus is going to articulate to us how we live out the Beatitudes. So in the next passage of scripture here, verse 13, he's saying, this is how you live out the Beatitudes, the things that I want you to be like as followers of Christ. And the first two come so full circle when he talks about salt is, you should flavor and preserve well. If you are sitting in that audience and you heard Jesus declare this salt terminology, you would have understood salt a few ways. First of all, salt was used for flavoring in regards to meat. So people would put salt on their meat so that they could flavor it well, so that it tasted a little bit better. We do the same thing today. But they would also preserve it so that it slowly decayed. They would pack meat in salt and make sure uh, that, you know, it didn't go bad. There's a Laura Ingalls Wilder book, which is popular in my house too as well, and it says that Papa packed the fish in salt and they continued on their way. 
So this was a practice that wasn't just done in New Testament times. It was done uh, all the way until we got refrigerators. And so Jesus' people understood that flavoring and preservation was the purpose of salt. And it wasn't made from the evaporation of salt water, but it came from salt marshes of the southwest of the Dead Sea. Salt also had monetary value. If you were a Roman soldier, for example, you would have essentially gotten the title that you are worthy of your salt. Because you would be paid in salt because it was something that could uh, help you and your family as you continue to provide for the basic needs of those people entrusted to your care. Now, when Jesus says that you are the salt of the earth, underline that in your Bible because essentially he is speaking figuratively about us doing those two specific things. You are called first and foremost as a believer of Jesus Christ to flavor or populate the physical earth. You are commanded to participate in the ways of the world but not be of the world. You are called as a believer to exist. I think sometimes we just want to crawl in our hole and say, I'm okay, I don't want to be here, right? Like, people drive me nuts. How many times have you been there? You look at it, people drive me crazy, and it's funny, we're one of people, so have to understand that if people drive you crazy, maybe you drive somebody crazy. <clears throat> you populate the physical earth. You flavor it well. Number two, you preserve, though, not just populate or exist in that culture, you have the ability and you are called and commanded to influence it. You are called and commanded to influence the world in which you live. Jesus is essentially saying, I want you in 1st, 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 to live out through the body, your body, as my moral agents, the be attitudes that I have just previously given to you. Why? Because God will ask for an account of how you lived your life on earth. Meaning everything that we do in this life has equally and eternally significant value. How you spend your days, how you spend your minutes, how you spend your hours matters to God, but it also matters to somebody else. Somebody told me a long time ago, and I think it's true, you are the answer to somebody else's prayer request. I think about that every time that I go through and get my groceries, and the young guy or the young girl who's sitting there scanning the groceries, I think to myself, I wonder if your mom or dad are praying right now that somebody would open up their mouth and love you the way that Jesus loves me. You are the answer to somebody else's prayer request. You are God's agent to flavor and preserve the earth. He uses you. Do you see yourself this morning as somebody who is valued? And maybe the first step for you is you need to just wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, God thinks that I am worthy. So many of us have a poor self-image. We need to look in the mirror and say, God thinks that I am worthy to accomplish his will today for his glory and not for mine. Do you see yourself as somebody that God sees you for? Do you realize that he has put you in places in this world to populate and to influence? And then he continues. He says, well, what if salt loses its taste? Now, this is interesting because this is where some people look at us and they say, this is where the Bible has problems, right? This is a fallacy because that's problematic. Salt, sodium chloride, NaCl, had to Google that too. It's been a long time since I've taken chemistry. And let's just be honest, I didn't do real well in chemistry either is an extremely stable element and it cannot lose its flavor. So if you were sitting there and you heard Jesus say these things, you would think to yourself, wait, hold on a second, that's impossible. That's, that's something that doesn't happen. That's something that doesn't transpire. And this isn't a chemistry lesson from Jesus. His question is rhetorical because everybody knew that it is counter to nature that salt loses its flavor unless it's mingled or become impure with the elements of the world. So if you're sitting there and you're hearing that, you would say salt has lost its effectiveness the more it participates with elements that it shouldn't be participating with. Iodine, for example. And Jesus says in the text that it becomes useless. Now, if you're sitting there, like that would have made tons of sense to you because here's what happened. People had two-story houses, right? And if you had a two-story house, often somebody lived on the top floor and somebody lived on the bottom floor and then they would build them up even higher than that. And if you go to Israel, you'll still see this today. 
In the east, it's awesome because you see all of these houses that essentially are stacked on top of each other, and they have these porticos or porches that are off of their houses. And what happens is in the, uh, the porch is made with dirt, and then if you sit on top of that uh, dirt, you'll realize that there's little white specks all over the place. You know what those are? Salt, right, you're, you're following, absolutely, right? How can you go wrong with that? Somebody's like, pepper, no. Uh. And the children would go out there and they would play and what would happen and transpire as the children played, it would, the salt would be trampled underneath of their feet. It would pack in with the dirt. And then you might have like company over and you guys would sit around and you'd talk like we do and, and you'd have conversations and you'd be sitting there and you would be reminded if you were in the audience of Jesus' day, you would have said, that makes total sense because I was just over at Frank's house and we were having a conversation and I saw salt all over his floor. And they would put that salt there because it was useless. It was mingled with elements that were worldly. And Jesus says, disciples of Christ lose effectiveness the more they become entangled with the world and then they get trampled underneath people's feet. You remember in Genesis chapter 19, God is gonna save his people from Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember that story? Sodom and Gomorrah makes Vegas look like Disney World, right? And you get to this part of the story and God essentially says, I'm gonna save you. And there's a man named Lot and he's wicked as all get out. Like he's twisted. He's your uncle that you don't invite to family reunions, right? And Uncle Lot comes in and God's like, I'm gonna save him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work in and through the situation. He says, you gotta leave this city. And so he grabs his wife and she, uh, we don't know her name. We just know she's Lot's wife, right? How would you like to be that girl in heaven? Hey, that's Lot's wife. Anyway, we don't know if she's there. Anyway, regardless, um, they leave the city and God says, you cannot look back. You can't, you can't look back at that city. And you know what happens? Lot doesn't. He, he's like, I, I know that I'm going to be restored. So he goes and he walks away. But his wife, she turns and she looks at the city and she becomes a pillar of, do you think that's just coincidence that it's in the text? Do you think it's just coincidence that people trampled over her? Do you think it's coincidence that if you were a Jew sitting here and you heard this story, that would have resonated in your mind? Too many believers lose their flavor and influence when they embrace the world, the world over the word. Do you? Jesus is issuing a warning to his disciples, the 12 and beyond, against being defiled or impure. He says, as he said in verse 8, do not have divided interest. Your interest should be to do my work and my will, to honor me alone. As salt flavors and preserves food, so believers do to the world. Do you remember the old song, Give Me One Pure and Holy Passion? Give Me One Magnificent Obsession, right? You remember that song? Some of you guys are like, I have no idea, but we sang it over campfires all the time. And the last line of that song is, give me one glorious ambition for my life to know and follow hard after you. To know and follow hard after Christ means that we use where God has positioned us for effectiveness and not become mingled with the world where we're trampled underneath people's feet. He has positioned you and placed you so that you proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into glorious light. He wants you to open up your mouth and use your hands just as much. He wants you to leverage every situation that you're in, whether young or old, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That could be in your home, the way you treat your spouse. That could be the way you walk with your kids. It could be in your relationships at work and your relationships with your family. Do you see those places as consuming for your own benefit or contributing to the cause of Christ? To maintain saltiness or usefulness, as Christ says, means that we do not allow the world to dilute our effectiveness. In 1 Corinthians, it says, stand strong. My home should look different than the rest of the world. My kids and the way that I treat them should be different than the rest of the world. The way I treat my spouse should be different than the rest of the world. Some of you guys are looking at it and you're going, man, uh, yeah, but you just kind of like dogged on her a little bit while you were up here. You don't understand what happens in the van when we leave church. Just kidding. It's amazing how much Christ is calling us to empty ourselves so that we can seek and save. 
You are the salt of the earth. You have value, you have flavor, and you have purpose. And you can make a difference in the world when you're different from the world. The question on the table is, how are you different? Evaluate that. How am I different in regards to my relationship with my spouse? How am I different in regards to my relationship with my kids? How am I different in the relationship that I have with the people who are at work? And some of you, uh, your work is being a stay-at-home mom or dad. How are you utilizing that time effectively that God has given to you and entrusted to your care? Everything is done for the glory of God. And it ties right back into the Beatitudes. Okay, so uh, this is what we're, we're aiming for right here. To be pink. <laughs> so fun. Every morning I put this in uh, apple cider vinegar and I drink it with uh, diluted water. And I think to myself all the time, this is how it is. You're like, you got, he's crazy. I pastored this church for like nine years. Of course I'm crazy. You know that already, all right? <clears throat> so there you go, all right? So you need to look at table salt a little bit differently. Then we got this, this thing right here. How many of you guys think that looks like the Pixar light? <laughs> when you walked into church, you were like, that's, that's the Pixar light. Jordan stole the Pixar light. And I did. And, and I'll sell it to you for a price. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so just as salt can be looked at one way, let's look at light a different way. Research shows that incandescent and fluorescent lights are bad for you. <laughs> I'm just ruining your day. I'm so sorry. Incandescent light bulbs produce a great amount of carbon dioxide and heat. They push cooling systems to work harder, and you get this thing called greenhouse gas. P.S. Don't Google greenhouse gas. Anyway. <laughs> so you enter this LED light thing, right? LED uh, light is light-emitting diodes, and they're like 80% more effective than traditional lighting. 95% of energy, according to my research, in an LED light is converted into light, and only 5% of it is wasted. And to prove this fact, I put it in my garage, and it's awesome. It's so much brighter, and we have it all around this sanctuary, except for here, here, and here. And that little guy burned out, and he might blow up, and if he does, I'm sorry for your loss. <clears throat> <laughs> but it's interesting even as we're sitting here, like I was thinking about this as we were worshiping and singing in, in, in song, and, and I thought to myself, like, okay, there's a difference between these lights and these lights, and on the surface, I can't see it, but if I go do the research and I spend time looking at those lights, I can tell the difference. If I were to go up to that chandelier and put my hand on the chandelier, I could feel the heat coming off of it, but if I go to one of these other lights, these pocket lights, I can't feel the heat coming off of it as much. These ones are a little bit more dangerous than these ones are, and so what we have here is Jesus is essentially going to unpack this for us. If you look at uh, verse 14, he says, you... Again, say me, say me, say me. He's talking to you, okay? You're not only called to be different than the world. This is not you. This is you, okay? You're called to be the uh, salt of the earth, or the salt of the earth, and also the light of the world. A city on a hill can't be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. So, being the light of the world, you let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Follow. If salt can make a difference in food, light makes a difference in our surroundings. Just as salt needed to be uh, there so it prevented rotting and decaying, light is needed in the world because the world is in darkness. Now, if you were sitting there, Old Testament, would have kind of started creeping up in your mind. In John chapter 8, Jesus is going to be called the light of the world, but Satan is also called in Isaiah chapter 14, the day star. So there's two different lights, and it's your choice on who you're going to follow in regards to what light you're going to be under. you got a choice. Either you can be underneath Jesus Christ, the light of the world, or you can be underneath Satan, and it matters because Jesus said, whoever follows after me will never walk in darkness in John 8, but will have the light of life. Satan, on the other hand, blinds the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the true light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is made in the image of God. So you pick and choose, knowing that you're a sinner and you've fallen short of the glory of God, you pick and choose what light you want to be under. 
I remember when we put LED lights in our garage, Bethany would look at me in the living room or in the kitchen and she would say, are the garage lights on or off? Because essentially uh, those lights were the exact same brightness as it was outside. But before we changed over, we couldn't, we, we couldn't see. Like we just, we just kind of knew that it was dark in there and these lights weren't working right. But all of a sudden now um, we, we match it and we overcome it. So Jesus says, you are the light of the world, verse 14, means not only are you receiving of light, but you give it out as well. See, you open up the garage door and let that light out. You don't conceal it, so it's just for yourself. Too many people get saved and think to themselves, this Jesus is just for me. It's not just for you. It's for Bremen. It's for South Bend. It's for Mishawaka. It's for Wyatt. It's for Chicago. You cannot have Christianity concealed. You have to give it away. It drives me crazy when people say, well, I just have Jesus and I don't go to church. Then I don't think you have Jesus because Jesus died on the cross for the church. This is the fellowship of the believers, the ecclesia. He says, you need other people just as much as you need me. And so when somebody looks at me and they're like, I'm just a closet Christian. I'm like, that's just bat crap crazy. I said this to you were in church. I'm super sorry. It amazes me because here's what's happening. Watch this, watch this. If you're a Pharisee and you're sitting in this congregation and Jesus said light of the world, you would have lost your mind because rabbis were given that title because they had knowledge that was hidden uh, from other people. So, so there were Jews that would look at other people and they would say essentially like, we're the light of the world. In other words, we have knowledge that you cannot have yourself. And Jesus is calling peasants and fishermen lights of the world. And if you were a rabbi in that time, you would have gone crazy. Because you would have been irate that Jesus is using something that you called yourself for somebody else. Jesus doesn't say here, though, following the text, he doesn't say you become salt. He doesn't say you become light. He says you are light. Meaning you're either physically fulfilling or failing in your responsibilities as a believer. There's no middle ground in my relationship with Jesus. I don't halfway it. Isn't that amazing? Either I'm doing a good job or I'm not doing a good job. Either I'm all in or I'm not all in. It's like if you were to play a sport and, and you, you, you came off uh, and they're like, hey, how did you do? And let's say you're a fighter. Either you won or you lost. That's it. Either you're fulfilling or you're failing in your responsibilities. Either you're for the culture or you're against the culture. And other people will chase physical pleasures and selfish gain, but we're commanded, as Romans 13 says, verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision of the flesh to gratify its desires. The Bible specifically says that you make no provision for the flesh to win. You do everything you possibly can so that it loses. And then he says, you're a city set on a hill. If you're a fisherman, you're so encouraged. Yay! I'm the light of the world. And you're probably going to go rub it in some Pharisees' faces. And then he says, you're a city on a hill. And you know what he's saying? Put yourself out there. If you put anything above that in your Bibles, he's saying, put yourself out there. Prominent cities can't be hidden. You ever gone to Chicago and uh, you go into the city and you see the skyscrapers and you see it all, you can't take your eyes off of it, right? It's fascinating to me when you go into the city because it, all of a sudden town disappears. And Jesus, as he's speaking here, there was a, a, a town called uh, Sapeth, which is the highest city in Galilee and in Israel. And you could see it both far off and up close. And it might be that city. But listen, Jesus being the light of the world here, saying his followers must reflect his light like mirrors. But you cannot reflect an image if there's no light. So he's saying you are to be a lampstand, you are to be intentional, is the key word there, about letting Christ's light shine. You are to be intentional. You remodeled the living room or your bedroom. You were intentional about where you placed the light. If I were to go into my garage and put uh, these neat LED lights on the floor, underneath of all the shelves and underneath all of the stuff, underneath the lawnmower, 
It wouldn't be effective, right? Jesus is essentially saying, I've given you tools, responsibilities, places to populate. I've given you things beyond your wildest dreams so that you could be effective. But you can't hide those. You have to position them properly so that you can be placed to do great works. You cannot be useful underneath baskets. You have to be exposed. Jesus is saying there's no such thing here as a secret believer. Your faith always has to go public. It always has to be made known. Light here and salt remind us that our lives are to be marked by these beatitudes on display. Is Jesus your awkward friend? You know, Bethany and I were talking about this the other day, and our, uh, our kids are going through some really interesting things at school, and they come home with the wildest stories. Man, we should film these. They'd go viral. We'd make a ton of money on YouTube, and then we retire. Uh, but we're not going to do that because we're not exploiting our kids for money. Who does that? Um, but they came home the other day and, and we were kind of walking through like some of their friends and I was like man Bethany like our kids friends are weird people right and she's like I know and I was like my friends when I was growing up I mean they were weird people and she's like me too and then I thought think about it and say it and I was like maybe we're weird people right <laughs> and uh, I, I started like kind of just just thinking this thing through about about uh, being, being weird and um, th- these are our kids and they have these relationships with these, these individuals and then I started thinking kind of how neat that is for them right because they have the opportunity to help somebody see their potential and they're helping them see it themselves and then we, we talked a little bit about um, just how much like they influence these people and so uh, there's this little app on, on our phones and um, my, my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter, Gianna, Bethany texts me. She's like, you got to hear what Gianna said the other day at school. And so they read books, and then they, they'll, like, record them or whatever, and then they say something about themselves. And, and Gianna says, my name is Gianna, and, and um, I'm, I'm in first grade. And I just, and you can hear her kind of being a little quiet. She's like, I just, I really like people, and I like to laugh, and I like to joke around, and I also like... Uh, just doing fun stuff and being crazy and if you ever want to pray for if you ever want me to pray for you I'll pray for you and I'll tell you about Jesus and I was like oh that's so cool but in my mind I thought you should proclaim that kiddo like you should get a little louder with that and I think sometimes we think to ourselves that we have all these awkward friends and Jesus is our awkward friend and we don't want to go public with it but the more we go public with the fact that Jesus is our savior and he died on the cross for our sins. We're not ashamed of the gospel that's in us. As a matter of fact, we're excited about it. And even growing up, I was never ashamed about the fact that I had all these awkward friends because they essentially helped me. And I realized that the awkward friends were better than the non-awkward friends because at least the weird people will tell you what's really going on in your life. At least those weird people that, that, that we, we had uh, relationships and, and friendships with, at least they were people who were always transparent. And I think Jesus is like that sometimes in our life. He looks at us and he says, listen, it's going to get weird sometimes, but it has to get weird sometimes in order for you to grow. It's got to be sticky sometimes. It's got to be at this point where it doesn't feel comfortable all the time. My relationship with Christ is not always comfortable. And the more we proclaim the excellencies and go public with this Jesus guy, the more awkward it's going to be. But James says, when you go through trials and tribulations, that's okay. When you start talking to your wife and your kids and your coworkers about what Christ is doing in your life and you start getting to the bottom of the issues of why you struggle and you eliminate your pride and you start proclaiming Jesus and saying, I need some help, you're going to see God work and move in your life and it's going to be amazing because you brought your awkward friend to the front and center and said this is who I stand with I'm not worried and concerned about being popular I'm not worried and concerned about my place here in this world I'm worried and concerned about my place in eternity and so man I want to be a a light giver just as much as I'm a light receiver our purpose in letting our light shine by doing good works is so that others will have the opportunity to glorify God as well so how do I turn the lights on and shine? And I, I Googled this too as well. I was like, how do I shine? And I found all these, these, these like four steps and five steps and I realized those just made me want to vomit. Because here's how you shine. You ready for this? You be unapologetically unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
the object of our shining is not that men may see how good we are, nor even see us at all, but they, they may see grace in us and God in us and cry, what a father these people must have. Close with this. The story is told of a guy whose job I was thinking about when I read this. He's at the railroad tracks with a, a light in his hand, and he's warning of a, a train of an upcoming bridge that was going out. And uh, essentially what happens is this guy's got this, this warning light, and he's doing this, you know, and, and the train just goes flying right on by. It never hit its brakes. Boom, right into the creek, man. It's probably it's the union's fault, right? And... Uh, <laughs> And um, just kidding, if you're part of a union, I'm batting a thousand today, man. I'm going to get persecuted like crazy tomorrow. But anyway, um, we're not ready yet. We're not ready yet. We're, we're going to have a fire drill after church, so you're going to have to hold on for that. But we're not ready for that. That's a good light, though. That's a good. That's good. Um, so anyway, uh, so he gets in trouble. Um, how do you rebound off of that? <laughs> and, the, and the judge uh, brings all these, these people into, this, into the courtroom, right? And uh, he's essentially got this guy, and he's, he's sitting on the stand. And he says, okay, what, what happened? And he says, well, the bridge was out. He says, okay, what were you commanded to do? I was commanded to go out there, and I was commanded to take my light, and I was commanded to pick it up, and I was commanded to hold it up as high as I possibly could go. He's like, all right, did you do that? He said, yeah, absolutely, I did that. He said, all right, what else did you do? He said, I noticed the train was coming a little bit closer, so I started waving it back and forth, right? And then I realized, like, he wasn't stopping, okay? What else? He says, well, then the train passed me, and I realized that I, I, I didn't really know what to do, and so I put my light down. He says, and then, and, 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 and then what happened? And he says, and then the train went into the, the creek because the bridge was out. And so the judge, he, he looks at him. And he says, can I ask you a, a simple question? He's like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did you turn it on? And he says, nope, sure didn't. See, what's amazing to me about what Jesus says is, you can do all the things, but if you don't open your mouth, it's worthless. You can say all the things, but if you don't live correctly, it's worthless. A life lived for the gospel of Jesus Christ is a balance between our words and our actions and strategically placing them for a purpose so that we can proclaim Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Are you table salt? Are you mixed in with the world in what you say and what you do? Or are you Himalayan, which is pure and unapologetically proclaiming Jesus. People will continue to put this on their table because they think it is effective and they will justify it as much as they possibly can. But we look at it and we go, but we know a better way. And it's proven and it's tested. And we realize its effectiveness the more we have balance because of it. Are you incandescent or dangerous light? Are your actions reckless? Do you live in contradiction to the word of God? Or are you pure light like Christ, where your hands and feet match your talk? All of this boils down to, I think we need to remember, we cannot reflect that which we haven't obtained. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you have to start there. If you have not confessed with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, then God cannot use you. But if you have, if you've made the decision to follow in faith, sometimes our sin entangles us and trips us up and we turn the lights off. Not that we've lost our relationship with Jesus, but we've distanced ourselves from him. And a big prayer for us is to turn those lights back on. Jesus' disciples are to be pure salt of the earth, true light of the world. Are you that way? Are you striving to become that way? In Romans, Paul will write in, ver in chapter 1, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to me 
say me. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, this is a, this is a heavy word. Um, and God, um, I, I've just wrestled with it all week. And I think sometimes the, the biggest thing that, that we wrestle with, I know, I know it, it's true, is that we've justified our own sin. But we're, we're okay with, with this, this life that, that, that we, we live because we've gotten to the point where we just justify our sins away. And we say, well, I'm this way because this is how I was raised. Or I'm this way because we've been married for 40 years. Or I'm this way because my mom and dad were a certain way to me. We look in the mirror and we're just stricken by all of the past. And, it, and God, it def- we, we use all that junk, all that baggage, all that luggage to define us. And then Satan just comes in and he, he enters and he whispers lies to us all the time. And then you come in and you move Satan away and you wash the mirror and you say, look again. Look differently. Change your perspective. God, I don't know who's here and how they feel about themselves, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, would you uplift and encourage your church right now? And help us to see that you've called us, positioned us, and placed us for effectiveness. Maybe for some of us, it's, it's been issues with our kids, or maybe for some of us, it's been issues with our job, or maybe for some of us, it's been issues with family members, or maybe for some of us, God, it's with sickness. And that, that disease just continues to creep back in, and we can't seem to get better. Would you help us to realize that's not what defines us? That we can try again. And I thank you that you're the God of second chances and third chances and four chances, and 15th and 500th chances. And when you're called your children, you let us fail forward. Try again. God, help us to know here in this place that if we've been given light, we reflect it too as well. Help us not to stay in the dark with our our faith. Was to go public with it. Maybe for some of us, God, that's just telling the people that we work with that I believe in Jesus, which is so difficult. Maybe for some of us, it's, it's as simple as just pausing to pray for our food before we eat it. And the small steps that will lead to greater things. God, if I had one prayer for our church, it's that we would be unapologetically, unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we would turn the light on. And that we would warn well and in love. And tell people that the bridge is out. Give us the opportunity to realize that all those beatitudes are true when we do those things, that we will find ourselves blessed and impress upon our hearts to know the truth that your way is a better way. May we see you in all things as we continue to do your work in your will. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. We thank you for giving us the gift of eternal life. May we never take that gift for granted. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Community Gospel Church podcast. If you would like to support this ministry financially, simply log on to communitygospelchurch.com and click the Contribute tab.